uh, Ken Eagle. He's a professor of orthopedic surgery and uh, vice chair at uh, NYU Joint Diseases. Every year we have uh, some guest faculty. Usually it's one or two. This year we have four. So what I mean by that is um, we have a lot of faculty who year in and year out come and help out from all the institutions and practices around the uh, Philadelphia and um, uh, Lehigh Valley. And uh, we kind of have one or maybe two people come from outside. This year we have Ray Pensy, Spence Reed, Ken Eagle, and um, tomorrow we also have uh, Hassan Mir coming. So, uh, so hopefully that's to your benefit. Um, Dr. Eagle is going to actually uh, give a you know just give a lecture. A lot of the sessions this year, as you see, are case based, but we have a few just uh, lectures on slightly uh, unrelated topics uh, that hopefully have, is, are of interest to you. So um, he's going to talk about uh, resident education. Thanks, Saqib. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me here in Philadelphia. It's, uh, it's great to be here, I guess. Uh, that's coming from a Dallas Cowboys fan. Um, just by show of hands, I always like to know who I'm talking to. How many people out here are involved in resident education? Just a smattering. Huh? And how many residents are out there? Okay. And how many people never want to teach someone how to do something ever again? All right, well, I apologize ahead of time. Um, so, you know, the, a lot has changed in, in the way we educate residents, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience uh, at NYU. We've, we have a very large residency program, so we have a uh, uh, kind of a big laboratory, if you will, for us to try out lots of different things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the paradigm shift in, in training, talk about some of the barriers that we face in trying to implement some of these changes. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges uh, with regard to teaching technical competencies and the challenges of assessing non-technical competencies, which is probably a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, and uh, and I'll, at, I'll end up by just talking about our experience and the things that we're doing up in New York. So as far as the paradigm shift, <coughs> I think the goal of training residents uh, remains constant throughout all specialties and has remained constant for orthopedic surgery since, you know, at least over 100 years. And, and that is, we want to graduate residents who are competent to practice orthopedic surgery and care for patients with skill and compassion, exhibit professionalism that is expected of physicians, and who will maintain their skills through self-directed lifelong learning. And if you're going to be finishing up your training pretty soon, this, you're going to keep hearing this throughout your life about lifelong, lifelong learning. Now, coming from NYU, um, I want you to know that we are uh, probably the oldest orthopedic training program in the United States. And I, I don't say residency program, I say training program. That's because this guy here, Louis Albert Sayre, was the first professor of orthopedic surgery in the United States uh, at Bellevue Medical College, which is now NYU. And... Uh, Basically, he's the guy that everybody, you know, came to if you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. He trained them, and he wound up training all of the founding fathers of the American Orthopedic Association. And it wasn't until the late 1800s, like the 1880s and 90s, when uh, Halstead and Osler developed the system of residency training as we know it uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. And what they developed was that apprenticeship model with a pyramid system. They take a lot of trainees in at a you know a low level, and they'd spend years and years living in the hospital. And that's why they were called residents. Uh, and then when they deemed them to be ready, uh, they would spend a year as a chief resident, where they'd basically be like an attending, but with some supervision, and then uh, be granted the privileges to go out and practice uh, in society. And then Abraham Flexner. Um, went around the country beginning in 1904 and spent six years running around the United States and Canada uh, because there was a lot of concern that there were programs popped up all over the place. There was no centralized uh, oversight for any of the training. People, some programs were three years, some five years, some 10 years. There was no, um, uh, there was nothing that really centralized uh, and coordinated the educational activity. So, uh, this was um, um, 
coordinated by the American uh, Medical Association. And in 1910, he um, presented his results of his journeys. And the goal was to improve the quality of medical education and training in the United States and Canada. And basically, the recommendations that came out of this are, are what guided residency training and medical education from 1910 till about 2003. Now, the ACGME has changed from this apprenticeship model to more of a developmental model. And in this model, you, go, you start out as a novice and you hope to move on to become an independent practitioner. And in this model, it really has to do with acquiring the skills and the competencies and not directly related to the number of years that you spend in training. So, if you're a very talented and gifted person, you could potentially end up finishing your training in three years instead of five or four years. Or if you're not as good as someone else, it might take six or seven years. And they came up with the concepts of developmental milestones. And these were developed to enhance the ability to prepare physicians for practice with specific expectations articulated. And that accreditation for the programs would be based upon the outcomes of these uh, of these developmental milestones. So if programs are finishing their, and their residents are finishing at levels of four and five, they're going to be okay. But if they're graduating people who are at levels of two and three, they're going to get looked at. And they may have problems with uh, maintaining their level of accreditation. And furthermore, these milestones are there to help us as the educators identify residents who need additional help early on. So practically speaking, what does it mean? It means in order to be competent, you need to be able to pass the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery's licensing exam, which is made up of two parts. One, the written examination, part one, and part two, based on your clinical practice. And that brings us back to the question of what exactly is residency? What is residency training? Is it a job? Yes. Is it a continuation of education in medical school? Yes. So it's really a combination of these two things. So for those you know, residents who are out there, you, you know pretty well that you're out there for the first time in your life, you're making some money, you're getting a check, but you know, you're still learning. And medic, uh, orthopedic education in medical school is somewhat lacking, so you're really starting from the very beginning. And there's a tremendous amount of information that has to be accrued and condensed within this five years of, of time while you're working no more than 80 hours a week. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult. So we've talked about, you know, the, the way the paradigm is shift, but what are the barriers to implementing this type of, of training program? There are, there are a couple, and they, they're both on the trainee side and on the program side. And I would say first and foremost is probably the work hour restrictions. In July of 2003, the ACGME, uh, following the Bell Commission in New York City, established resident work hour restrictions. And they uh, dictated that a resident could work no more than 80 hours per week, averaged over a four week period, and no more than one continuous 24 hour period uh, within a seven day work week. Uh, and then you have uh, three hours of transition time added onto that, and that's used in various ways. And uh, nationally, you need to have eight hours off between shifts. In New York State, we have a different law and you have to have 10 hours off between shifts. Uh, you can have no in-house call more frequent than Q to three, four days per week, Q three or four per week, in a f over, averaged over a four-week period. Um, and your time on duty continuously can be uh, no longer than 24 hours, again, as mentioned, with that, that three-hour transition time. And now, in July of 2011, uh, they were concerned about the uh, most vulnerable, the interns, and they changed the 24-hour rule to a 16-hour day. Um, but in 2016, they reversed themselves and went back to 24 hours for the interns as well. Now, with this, obviously the intentions were good, right? They, they don't want to have uh, the interns and the residents being abused and being made to work as slave labor. Um, but there were certain unintended consequences. Obviously, if you work less hours, there's less time for training. Uh, and with this, there's been more focus on case logs. And so the ACGME is constantly monitoring your case logs, as you know. But it really doesn't differentiate between quality and quantity. And really what we're concerned about most these days, I think, is, is quality 
rather than the absolute number of procedures that you're doing. So they've actually, you know, it used to be they had, a, you know, they wanted well over 3,000 CPT codes, and they've cut that down. There really are no exact numbers, but if you, if you have too little, you're in trouble, and if you have too many, you're in trouble. And they, they really want to see somewhere around 2,500 CPT codes by the time you, you finish your training. Um, also, the use of free time. That's been an unintended consequence, too. You know, um, it was thought, well, you know, if someone's off post-call, they're going to use that time wisely. They're going to spend their time studying. There's going to be a lot more time for academics, maybe getting research projects done on their own time. But that really hasn't uh, happened. What we find in our program is people use their free time to do personal things. And, uh, you know, certainly they're, they're entitled, anyone's entitled to do that. Um, but, you know, people who aren't uh, as well organized may run into problems with some more increased uh, free time not used for uh, academic purposes. There's also been concern about the, the work ethic and the dedication of the so-called millennial generation, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, what's interesting is, uh, you know, people were concerned with, you know, the residents aren't in the hospital as much, there's gonna be a lot more problems with patient safety or things gonna fall through the cracks. And we really haven't seen that in any of the studies that have been published since the uh, institution of these work hour uh, rules 15 years ago. So, um, although the training has changed, uh, we certainly don't think it's uh, for the worse. Now, I mentioned the characteristics of the millennial generation, and I don't mean to uh, demean the millennial generation. I, I have some millennials myself in my house. Um, but I think it's important for us uh, who are out there as the educators to understand that they look at things a little bit differently. They're coming up in a system that's different from the one that we came through in. Uh, there have been a number of significant events that they have um, been witness to, September 11th, the global war on terror, lots of school violence, uh, and certain economic problems uh, that uh, they have certain, certainly been bombarded with. They've been raised by parents who've told them that, uh, you know, that they, they're great at everything they do. They're, they get a participation trophy. They're not allowed to fail. Uh, they're highly protected and overscheduled. Uh, with regard to workplace values, uh, they, they value uh, social connections, teamwork, um, and they, uh, they really like to have relationships with authority figures. I remember coming through and, and we were basically afraid of everybody who was in a position of authority and we just kind of kept quiet. And they really want to develop relationships and really, really seek that mentorship model. Also been a change in the, in the faculty dynamic. Um, the faculty has to learn to deal with this, uh, with a generation that sees things a little bit differently than they do. Um, the faculty has to be um, a teacher and a mentor, but they may not have gotten the mentoring or the training to be a teacher themselves. Um, they have to be able to accept feedback from the residents. It used to be that, you know, basically the residents did what we said and they didn't talk back. They didn't, they didn't tell us what they thought, but a lot of what we do is revolves around the feedback that we get from the trainees. Um, they may not feel comfortable with the mentoring relationship. Um, they need, to, they need to be involved more in the residency program itself uh, from the standpoint of identifying problem residents. Uh, and they have to learn how to provide constructive feedback. And this could be difficult for someone who, in their training, never received constructive feedback. It's a, it's a different way of approaching the training. It's less like the military, you know, and more like, like um, their higher ed the college education is now. And we see burnout. Is, as being a much bigger problem. And, and you can look at the surveys and literature, and we see, we see burnout both on the resident side and the faculty side. Um, but again, we see that uh, you can look at in the news every day, and you can see uh, there was a statistic just published that the rate of suicide in this country is up 25% in the last 20 years. And, um, you know, I'm not sure why that is. I have my own suspicions, but no data to, to support it. But it's something that we need to be aware of, right? Uh, because the, the workplace, the medical workplace is a very stressful environment. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we're dealing with younger people today who you know, may not have all of the tools and resources available to them to be able to deal with that stress. So you know, we're responsible for making sure that we keep an eye on everything that's going on. And moving on to the technical competency. Now, 
within the core competencies, most people realize, and the, AC, the ECGME and the ABOS came together and, and came out with the Milestones Project. Uh, they have the six core competency areas and the 16 orthopedic specific areas uh, that we're looking at. And those areas include the ones that are listed here within sports medicine, foot and ankle, fracture care, uh, hand, uh, adult reconstruction, tumor, spine, pediatrics, and shoulder. And I think for the technical competencies, medical knowledge and patient care, those are, those are pretty easy, right? We can, we can test medical knowledge uh, by asking trainees questions. We see how they do on the in-service every year. And as far as patient care, we make rounds with them. We see how they're uh, dealing with uh, patient-specific problems. We see them in the OR. We watch them uh, do surgery. So those are, are, are fairly um, evident to us as, as educators um, with regard to the competencies and milestones. Um, the interpersonal and communication skills need to be um, monitored as well. Professionalism, which includes compassion, integrity, respect, ethics, and diversity, as well as accountability to patients and society. Um, these are a little bit more difficult for us to kind of wrap our hands around and be able to evaluate. Systems-based practice and practice-based learning also, um, these deal with um, patient safety and quality of care, which as most people know are big buzzwords nowadays, um, but are, are being championed by the ACGME, certainly with the clear focus. Uh, and practice-based learning and improvement, these are self-directed learning um, projects, um, basically assessing how the residents or the trainees uh, are able to uh, use literature and their own experiences to improve uh, their patient care skills. Again, these are a little bit more difficult uh, to assess and assign a grade to. And for technical skills, you know, before we, we have the OR, but if we don't feel comfortable in the OR, simulation is a great tool. Uh, this way we can put them in a, in a position uh, to work on a, on, a, on a sawbone or a cadaver or a simulator in some way that uh, prepares them uh, for a surgical procedure and we can determine whether or not we think they have the technical competency to be able to have some independence in the operating room. And there are certain um, tools that we use, the uh, OSAT, the Objective Skills Assessment Test, basically putting it out there, a, uh, in, the, in this picture, a case of a repair of a radial fracture using a sawbone and a plate and screw construct and there's a checklist and the screen and the uh, uh, observer watches the, uh, the trainee go through the steps. And again, the, the minutia of the steps are less important as the, uh, as the overall flow and uh, assessment of their uh, understanding of the nature of the procedure. Uh, in addition, we have uh, OSCEs, Objective Structure Clinical Exams. These are um, uh, ways in which we can uh, observe a resident interact uh, with um, a, an actor who's portraying a patient. And then if you want to get even a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more real, we have the unannounced standardized patient, uh, which are uh, patients who come in uh, and the resident or trainee doesn't know uh, that they're being observed and it's done on mic or hidden camera. And uh, these people are assessed by the standardized patient on their interactions. Um, we use the OSAT as part of our resident uh, intern boot camp. Uh, we do it uh, before and after they go to uh, a skills course uh, and we uh, assess whether or not they retain the knowledge uh, from these experiences later on in the training. Um, if you're going to do something like this, it's very simple. We're not giving people A's, B's, and C's. It's basically uh, they're graded on specific things, you know, the way they handle the drill. Uh, did they use a drill guide? Did they uh, place the screw in correctly? Did they, use, did they select the correct plate? And, and each task is graded as done, partially done, or not done. So it's very simple. And then we translate this into the technical milestones in the operating room. And here, this is a screenshot from my uh, phone. And uh, we have all the milestone evaluations uh, online. Uh, so basically you can uh, put in a barcode, a QR code, uh, or scan it on your phone using a QR reader, and uh, it comes up, you type in the, re uh, the resident's name and the procedure they're doing, 
um, and all the data for that procedure. And then as they're doing it, you can watch them and basically use your finger to tap on the different uh, um, uh, procedures within the uh, case uh, to see whether or not they have achieved a certain level of independence. And uh, we found this to be quite useful. Again, it's difficult getting buy-in from the entire faculty, faculty uh, obviously because uh, it takes a little bit more time and people can't go as quickly as they uh, want uh, in their day. So it really takes a little bit of dedication. We don't expect every single case to be recorded, but if a resident is with an attending and they're doing four or five joints in a day, we'll expect that they fill out a milestone evaluation from that daily experience. So that's easy. The technical skills are easy to assess, but what about the non-technical skills? A little bit tougher. I talked about uh, the OSCEs, and we've used these for about 10 years or so now, and they're really good for, for um, looking at uh, the domain of professionalism. Um, and basically, we have the, a video uh, you know, OSCE room where uh, there are about six or seven different uh, actors that have uh, been given different scenarios and, and scripts. And, um, and the, you know, the resident has to interact with them, and some of them are difficult conversations, and uh, some is uh, obtaining uh, informed consent. Others are dealing with an impaired colleague. So we, we try to assess different aspects of professionalism and interpersonal skills. Uh, and then what we do is um, we, uh, we go through the checklist with the resident, and we let them watch the video. And um, it's a pretty powerful tool to use, and most medical students graduating today have had experience with this. They're using this throughout every medical school in the United States, and I would suggest that uh, if you have access to it in your, in your training program, it's, uh, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Um, we get feedback from the standardized patients. We get a, the resident gets a written report card of the domains tested. Um, you get to review the video again. Um, the group comes back, and they all look at it together. We, we look at things that are done very well, and let, and show them and say, hey, this is a really good example of, of giving informed consent, or we say, here's, here's a mistake, or here's something that could have been done better. And um, as one resident said to us, you can't deny your mistakes when you see them on video. So it's really a very powerful uh, tool. <clears throat> we, we had to get away from the unannounced standardized patients because we went to the uh, epic electronic medical record, and we found there was no way to create a fake um, record for a patient using that. But we used it for a while and we found it actually very, very important because here nobody knew, you know, the resident uh, didn't know that they were being watched. And it wasn't uh, to, you know, pick out specific things about a resident, but more so we kind of learned a lot of things about the flow because these unannounced standardized patients also gave us feedback on the staff and the clinics. So if people weren't helpful, if they saw that people weren't washing their hands. We kind of got that information and we were able to change some of the flow in the clinics. So with all this, we, you know, we, we'd done a little research and we, we looked at all of our results and we, we thought, you know, there's still got to be a better way, you know, of, of evaluating these non-technical skills. And we adopted the techniques of direct observation for patient encounters. And basically what it is is it's just like you know, you're know you in the OR with the resident doing the case. You're in the, you're in the exam room with the resident seeing the patient. So basically what happens is that the patient goes in for a, a clinical encounter with a, new, with a patient, either new or returning patient, and the attending sits there as a fly on the wall, just observing what's going on. And this enables us to confirm that the trainees are applying communication skills that we teach them uh, in our didactic lesson plan. Um, it helps to us to identify deficiencies. Uh, it provides a mechanism for us to give immediate feedback. Right as we step out of the room, we're able to just tell the resident, hey, you know, that was great, but you can improve by doing this, this, and this. Um, we think that this is a, a better assessment of actual practice than some of the, um, you know, uh, OSCE, uh, which really gives a sense of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not for real. Um, and it, most importantly, it satisfies a lot of what we're expected to do for the ACGME's clear focus areas. So when you get, you know, when your GME comes to you and asks how you're doing, you know, assessing your residents and whatnot, if you're doing these things, it checks a lot of boxes for them. Implementing this program is not so easy. <laughs> um, 
we started with a small core group of people um, observing the residents in outpatient clinics. Uh, we developed our own direct observation checklist. Uh, then we had to have sessions to teach the faculty about it and explain to them what, what our goals were and what we wanted to do. And all along, we collected data to be used in resident performance assessment. And over time, we kind of refined our way of doing it. We coned down the checklist and made it a lot more user friendly and quicker. And this is what it is, basically. I don't know if you can see that or not, but basically, as as the uh, resident is having this uh, interaction, you know, you just you're just checking off things. You know, did they introduce themselves? Did they wash their hands? You know, did they use open-ended questions? Um, you know, did they treat the patient with uh, uh, with respect? You know, did they use jargon? Lots of different things. But you can you can um, there's a lot of stuff out there, and you can tailor it to your own program's needs, or you can use some of the things that are given to you by the ACGME. Um, in getting the faculty to, to be involved, we basically had a faculty retreat where we brought some experts in in education, and we, we taught people about this. Uh, we gave them the rationale and the program design, and we reviewed the checklist. Um, and you know, we tried to get buy-in explaining how important it is. Um, and it is, because as we in the program director world uh, those of us who are responsible for making sure that we follow the rules, you know, there's a lot of oversight. And um, for the things that we do, we need to have data to back it up. And, and this, these types of things enable us to, uh, to do that. So faculty members, uh, they accompany the trainee into the exam room. They complete the encounter. Uh, right afterwards, they give them five to 10 minutes of feedback. Uh, and then they go down and in the clinic, you know, the resident will write the note and the attending will review the note and check it for accuracy and thoroughness and, and their thought process. And if there are any deficiencies there, then they're going to discuss it right then and there. So it's a, it's a really great learning process. And again, we don't do this for every patient, but in an entire day of clinic, you know, every resident will do this once with one patient encounter. So if they see 10 to 15 patients in a day, one will be a formal direct observation with an attending. And we collect the data, and I don't know if you can see this or it projects well, but you see these are the, main, the four main categories that, that you look at, engagement, do they show empathy, are they educating patients, and are they enlisting the patients in their, in their own health care. And you can see that we started out in the 40 to 50 percent range, and we're up to 80, 90 percent. Um, so that shows improvement, and that's over a couple of years. Uh, so not only is the faculty buying in, but the residents buy in. They like it. They like the feedback. Um, they look at this as a, a mentorship model for them. So it really hits home in a lot of different uh, aspects of, of the way training is going these days. So I'll, just, I'll end by just giving you a, a couple minutes of, uh, of what our experience has been. Initially, as you could imagine, a lot of resistance. Nobody likes change, especially orthopedic surgeons, right? Nobody wants to change their technique, the way they do surgery or anything. They don't want to they change their teaching style. The way they were taught is the right way. The way they do things is the right way, and, and that's it. So a lot of resistance. You know, the residents were grumpy about it. Oh, I got to spend five extra minutes doing this. I could see another patient in that time. But over time, um, you know, everybody has bought into it, and it's been great. And, and, and on both sides, the, the trainee and the educator side, lots of great feedback. And we were concerned, are we going to slow down the outpatient clinic? This, this checklist is cumbersome. Is there a Hawthorne effect? Um, more, more responsibility for our busy faculty. We're already asking them to do all this stuff, right? Take away time from generating RVUs. It's a problem. Um, we, could, we were worried that you know the faculty is just going to give everybody a five. It's everyone's going to be perfect and not really take the time. Um, and we have a very big program, so it's very you know logistically difficult for us to make sure that. Every resident gets four to five of these per year. But that's our goal. And we've been pretty successful in doing this. It didn't happen in the first month or the first six months or even the first year. But we're about two to three years into this now. And, and, and I would say for the most part, um, we have a pretty robust program in place. So how are we using this information? We're, um, we've reduced the number of required annual direct observations. Um, our trainees with clinical deficiencies, if they're noted, those are the ones. So instead of everyone getting four, five, six observations in a year, if, if you do a good job on a couple, 
you kind of, you know, you're not under the gun. But if you have problems, then those are the people that we want to focus on. Just like in the OR, you see a resident who's struggling in the OR, we're going to direct them more towards some surgical skill simulations. Um, these direct observations are included in all of our remediation plans for any resident who's having any issues, and we have to provide a remediation type program. Um, but we can, it's a continual process, and that's what the ACGME wants from us, right? They want improvement plans, continuous improvement plans. And, and this fits in perfectly because we're able to continually do this and we're able to alter the program based upon the pulse of what's going on at that time. If everybody's doing well and there are no problems, then it runs smoothly. But when we identify problems, then we can act on it. And we're able to do it, I think, a little bit earlier than we were in the past. So I'm going to sum up and, and finish here, and I'm going to tell you that orthopedic residency has changed. It certainly changed uh, from the 1890s, and it's continually changing, and the pace of change is probably uh, going to uh, continue uh, to be fairly rapid over the next several years. With the, shifts, with the shift towards a competency-based residency education training, uh, there is tendency to focus on skills and orthopedic knowledge, you know, with non-technical skills taking a back seat. But the non-technical skills with professionalism, effective communication, they're just as important. And um, I, will, I will tell you that, you know, a personal experience, you know, we've sent our residents graduate and they go out and practice in other states. And I've gotten calls from, you know, their chairman to tell me, you know, we hired so-and-so and he's doing a great job, but I was, I was amazed. Of all the faculty HCAP score um, feedback, he got the highest in his first year. He's like, what are you guys doing? And I, so I explained that we basically have a big focus on professionalism and interpersonal skills. And I've gotten that from, from about three or four chairmen who've hired our residents. So it makes me believe that what we're doing is the right thing. It is beneficial for the trainees. And uh, I think if you look at it and, and add it to your training programs, uh, and if you're a resident, you buy into it, I think it'll be very, very beneficial for you in your, in your practice uh, out there uh, for the next 30, 40 years. And finally, while lectures and OSCEs are useful uh, and up until now have been available tools, I think the direct observation of actual practice, both in the OR and in patient encounter, um, is really capable of, of improving, uh, in, uh, of improving what we all want, which is patient-centered, excellent orthopedic care. So with that, I will end, and I will be happy to ask any questions that you may have about this uh, concept. Thank you very much.